Welcome and thank you so much for tuning into the Psychology Is podcast. I'm Nick. I'm here with Nick. I'm Dr. Nick Fortino. This is Dr. Nick Haslam. We're here to have an interesting discussion about this topic called concept creep. I understand, Nick, that you coined this term. Have I? Do I have that right? I'm not 100% sure of that. I found one reference to it earlier. Okay. But I sort of ran with it, and I'm not sure the person who did invent it uh, meant exactly the same thing. So I'll mm. take credit. Yeah. And then I first heard the term in uh, the book by Jonathan Haidt and his co-author, The Coddling of the American Mind. I feel that he, you know, they really kind of popularized the term concept creep and, and leaned on it heavily uh, to explain, you know, their their perspective on how the American mind is being coddled. So we're going to talk all about that. I also want to just just ask you the quick question about the book of yours that I, I have a sense I should read called Psychology in the Bathroom. I'd love to hear you explain what that's about. And let me just say, though, for people who don't know you yet, that Dr. Haslam is a clinical and social psychologist and professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia, the author of nine books and over 250 journal articles, just a prolific academic. And it's an honor to have you on the podcast. It's my pleasure. We're uh, connecting across the world here. One of the great benefits of online communication. I'm out here yeah, in it's California. Good. And I'm talking to you from tomorrow. Uh, I wow. think I'm in Tuesday, you're in Monday. So it's right. uh, quite hard to get your head around that, isn't it? <laughs> yes, indeed. I love it. Well, let's just dive right in. So I have you know, several notes and some specific questions I plan to ask, and I'm sure much will come up spontaneously. So let's just begin by letting you explain what does the term concept creep mean? Concept creep means the gradual um, expansion of the meaning of harm-related words uh, over recent decades. So the example I often like to give is bullying. Um, bullying is an old concept. It goes back a long time. But in psychology, it was introduced by a Norwegian psychologist um, called Dan Olvius in the 1970s. And by that, he meant not just any old form of aggression um, uh, perpetrated against your peers, but a particular kind of repeated uh, intentional uh, aggression directed downwards um, from someone in power to someone with less power, either in terms of age or size or the number of bullies involved. Uh, and he understood it to be primarily occurring within a, uh, a school setting, I mean, among children. And I guess what we've seen since the 1970s is that bullying has come to refer to a much wider range of phenomena than it did then. So the obvious thing is we now tend to talk about bullying at least as often in corporate or work settings um, among adults, not necessarily behaving like adults, but among adults rather than about children. Um, scholars of bullying have relaxed all of those criteria so that you can say that you're bullying someone even if it's not intentional, even if it's not repeated, even if it's upwards or sideways in some sort of work hierarchy rather than only downwards. And we've also, of course, included new kinds of behaviour like cyberbullying under that bullying label because there wasn't a cyber to use to bully back in the 70s. So um, concept creep refers to that process whereby words come to expand their range of meanings. And my claim is that uh, um, quite any number of words might expand their meanings over time, but I'm particularly interested in those which have to do with harm, ways in which people are damaged, hurt others, um, uh, and, and concepts in that general zone. Mm. There's a paper for the people who are listening that I recommend you read. You wrote it in 2016. It's called Concept Creep. The subtitle is, I'm not remembering the subtitle exactly. I can look at it on my computer quickly here. And you might remember that up your head. It's uh, The title is Concept Creep, Psychology's Expanding Concepts of Harm and Pathology. So that's another interesting area that this relates to is pathology and specifically mental disorder. And, you know, most people listening to this podcast at all consistently know that I'm very interested in 
diagnostic expansion in the DSM. We've had many guests who are experts on that topic. And, and so I feel like this, this is relevant, you know, and of, of interest to many of the, these, the podcast listeners here. So before we get into the disorder topic specifically, I just want to add the words, you know, that you coined um, to back up what you're saying here, which is horizontal creeping and vertical sort of creeping or expansion of these concepts. I understand horizontal is referring to this outward expansion of the definition of a concept to capture qualitatively different phenomena, stuff that simply would did not qualify as being bullying or trauma or addiction or a disorder. And then the vertical expansion has to do with not different kinds of phenomena, but different degrees of a phenomenon where now less extreme versions of a certain experience are now classified as, you know, under one of these concepts. You talk about how the implications are ambivalent. And I think this is, it's a very interesting reflection. Is this a good thing or not? Are there benefits to concept creep and are there drawbacks to concept creep? So I'm curious to hear your reflections in this moment on the ambivalent implications of concept creep. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a, I mean, you've, you summarize the um, vertical and horizontal um, ideas beautifully, better than I could have done myself. But, but yeah, I mean, I think pretty much any change is likely to have some positives and some negatives. That strikes me as just a kind of obvious uh, sort of mature way to look at any kind of historical change. And so I'm certainly not against the idea of um, concepts broadening over time. I think sometimes critics of this idea have implied that somehow um, I and my fellow researchers would prefer that things had stayed the same and what we're just being reactionary or conservative about these things. Rather, what we're trying to do is just describe a pattern of phenomena that are occurring, changes that are happening, and try to speculate and do research on what the benefits and costs might be. So, for instance, take diagnostic expansion. You can talk about that as a, uh, as a bad thing or as a good thing. To some extent, it's a good thing because people who were suffering are now being recognised, legitimated, maybe receiving treatment they wouldn't have received before. Um, a student of mine, Jesse C., just published a paper in the last week showing that people with more inclusive concepts of mental disorder were more likely to seek help for mental health problems. So that's a good thing, right? Uh, on the other hand, it's not hard to see that diagnostic expansion could lead to pathologizing ordinary experiences, could lead to overdiagnosis, overtreatment, people feeling more vulnerable than they actually are, um, people adopting you know, victim or disorder identities when it might be against their best interests to do that. So what we've tried to do when exploring uh, examples of concept creep, which, as you say, include uh, in the realm of clinical psychology, is to just speculate on advantages and disadvantages and assume that there might be some of both. Mm. So one, you know, and, and perhaps it's, you know, these advantages and disadvantages are specific to exactly which concept we're talking about. And, you know, you just gave a good example of the a benefit of the expansion of certain criteria for disorders and how, you know, some people may not have been have may not have qualified for having a disorder and thus may not have access treatment to it. So that is a benefit. And then it's an interesting drawback. So I guess we are kind of veering into the topic of disorders here. It, I often think about how problematic it can be when a person is diagnosed for something that I think is normal, let's say. And I, I would argue, I would definitely assert that the, di the diagnostic statistical manual for many constructs in there, the criteria have expanded too much to now include what we previously thought of as perfectly normal human responses to experiences. And for me, it's obvious to see why that's problematic and why it's, and you used an interesting phrase there. You, you said, you know, uh, paraphrasing you, you said that, um, a person can begin to identify as having a disorder or being a victim. So what do you think is a disadvantage of taking on an identity of having a disorder or of being a victim? 
Yeah, well, I mean, victim isn't relevant in most cases, I think. You know, I didn't use that term, but in terms of most, you know, uh, mental health problems, you're not necessarily a victim, but you are someone who has uh, or is, is decided to have some sort of uh, disorder. I think, you know, any kind of noun label we adopt um, can be empowering and it can also be limiting. So as long as I start to see myself as a depressive or a person with schizophrenia uh, or as a person with a particular condition, uh, processes take place in group perception where I tend to think that's some sort of enduring characteristic of who I am. Mm. I have the essence of depression or it is in my nature to be like this. And that makes you less likely to uh, make efforts to uh, change it. It makes you more pessimistic about the opportunities uh, that you might have to grow or change. Uh, it's limiting. So I think, uh, and it's not only limiting, it can also be strengthening. You can find a community of people who are suffering the same things you are. You can find a label to make sense of the confusion you're experiencing about your own suffering. But um, to think that their only benefit strikes me as naive. So um, yes, I think uh, part of the problem is if you see yourself as um, belonging to some class, um, especially if it's a class that people tend to see as being enduring over time, then you are limiting your capacity to change. Well said. And it's really a prime example of a self-fulfilling prophecy and I know you know what that is, but for listeners who might not have that definition in their mind, a self-fulfilling prophecy is a belief that essentially causes itself to become true. And I think sometimes the notion of a self-fulfilling prophecy is depicted as a little bit more magical than it needs to be, because it's simply based on the principle that beliefs affect behavior. And so if you believe, like you descri described, um, that you are a, a person who has depression, you might act as such and you might it, it can prime your perception it can you know just fuel certain emotional patterns that are in accordance with that belief and people sometimes overlook the fact that that identity itself that belief itself that self-concept is actually what's causing that's that behavior and, and and i suppose it kind of becomes a cycle because then the behaviors actually do cause the depression and then that confirms the belief which confirms the behavior and emotional patterns and the prophecy fulfills itself yeah and that's a very insightful observation i think nick um and, and the same thing that's going on sort of microscopically in individual persons i think is happening historically mm -hmm. uh in, in terms of cultures i mean the great canadian philosopher ian hacking who i cite a lot says something similar happens uh, in terms of diagnostic categories themselves you know when we invent some sort of new category like post-traumatic stress disorder we sort of bring it into existence because people uh, judge others with respect to that category. People assimilate themselves to that category and make sense of their experience through that category. And in a sense, it makes that category come into being in some way. He called those, you know, looping effects. Um, and, you know, I think this self-fulfilling prophecy idea is a really powerful one. We're in furious agreement. Mm, indeed, I can feel that. And with post-traumatic stress disorder in particular, I just kind of took a deep dive into that and, you know, on this. So we published this podcast to all the podcast streaming platforms, platforms, but also YouTube. And we also create short YouTube videos that are educational and entertaining. And we did a video on PTSD and just took a deep dive into the evolution of the concept. And it didn't come around until the DSM-3, which was published in 1980. And the... DSM-3 and then the revised version in 87 and then the DSM-4 in 94 and the revised version in 2000 and then the DSM-5 in 2013 each have defined the note the, no, the, the uh, con have defined trauma differently first of all and the criteria for what PTSD means differently and generally the direction is in expanding it to include more symptoms than it used to include. So that's a prime example of a mental disorder that has been subject to concept creep. And again, we can see the advantages and the disadvantages of that. Yeah, For sure. And look, um, you know, my colleagues and I have written on exactly that topic recently. We've got a paper that came out in a journal called Social Research uh, last year with my um, grad student, Melanie McGrath. Uh, where we 
do the same sort of thing, exploring the changing meanings of, his, of, of trauma over time. Mm. Uh, and you're right. I mean, um, you, you know, DSM-3 had a relatively narrow definition of what counted as a traumatic event. DSM-3R um, um, and DSM-4 um, somewhat relaxed that. DSM-5 tightened back up a little bit. So there's not only inflation happening. True. And look, these things weren't done just in order to um, you know, colonize new areas of human suffering, as I think some critics of diagnostic expansion say. It's done partly because some people who didn't have events that were meeting the DSM-3 criterion for what's a trauma was still you know, unquestionably showing post-traumatic symptoms. So what do we do? We say, well, we're not going to treat you because uh, although you're suffering, you know, all of these horrible symptoms, the, the thing you suffered actually objectively wasn't quite bad enough. What are you going to do about that? So I think a lot of it was well motivated, but you're quite right. Uh, it leads to a, a broadening of what counts. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I also want to, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting my own work a little bit too much, so I, I promise I'll stop doing that. No, 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 but, uh, you know, uh, this idea that uh, DSMs have consistently expanded is a little bit, I think, uh, questionable. <laughs> Certainly it has for some conditions. But, um, again, we had a meta-analysis uh, with the student Fabian Fabiano, in clinical psychology review, um, I think last year, uh, doing a meta-analysis of all of the changing prevalences across different um, DSM revisions. Uh, and, and overall, there hasn't been much vertical expansion. Mm -hmm. In fact, none overall. Some in, some additional changes have been inflationary, some have been deflationary. From DSM-3 to DSM-5, there hasn't overall been a tendency for um, diagnostic criteria to loosen, at least according to our analysis. But it certainly has for some conditions like, you know, attention deficit disorder, or right. ADHD. Uh, so there are some cases where it's inflated, some cases where it's deflated. Certainly what we're not saying is that everything is inflated. We've just pointed to some sort of pattern taking place. Mm. Would you, did you find that although there wasn't as much vertical inflation as people might say, was there a more horizontal expansion? We didn't look at that because that's okay. sort of harder to judge. I think yeah. that's the answer, actually. I think there has been inflation in terms of adding new conditions. So in this situation, horizontal expansion counts as adding entirely new uh, you know, realms of psychopathology, mm. um, not necessarily milder ones, but just new ones. Now, if you look at DSM-1 to DSM-5, yes, for sure, there's been this, as you well know, uh, there's been this addition of whole new zones of you know, mental disorder. So eating disorders were, weren't there in the DSM-1 or 2. Um, you know, um, disorders of childhood were basically ignored by the early DSMs. So there's been an inclusion of new kinds of disorder. I think that's really where the main story is, in my view, uh, in terms of how diagnostic expansion has occurred. More that than the sort of downward expansion of recognising milder and milder conditions, although that has certainly occurred for some disorders. Mm -hmm. Yep. My analysis leads me to the same exact conclusion, although it wasn't exactly, you know, as systematic as a meta-analysis, but interesting. Um, you know, one one concept that I think has, is creeping out significantly is the concept of violence. And um, that wasn't one that you addressed in this 2016 paper, but I would love to hear your thoughts on, on what's happening with the concept of violence. And... You know, one statement you made in the abstract of that paper was that uh, concept creep is reflects a liberal moral agenda. And it's an interesting statement that I, I would love to hear you say more about. I, my, I have a sense of agreeing, but I want to hear you ex, ex, elaborate on that a little bit. But I'll say quickly about the word violence. A good example, I think, of vertical in inflation and expansion here is with the word violence in that we used to use the word to refer to something that causes much more harm than what we now cause. And, and you could even say that it, maybe this is more horizontal, but it went from physical harm caused to even now just feelings being hurt. That might be a horizontal expansion, but even just if you look at vertical expansion, you know, I think there was a time at least in the in the US culture where, you know, let's say a parent pulling their kid by the ear when their kid is acting rude would never have been considered to be violent. But now I think many more people would describe that as violent. So there's that. But there's also 
a very specific horizontally based expansion of the word violence that I personally reject, which is this idea that something can be considered violent regardless of the perpetrator's intentions. That now is considered violence. So if, if I, you know, so like an example, obviously if I decide I'm going to punch you in the face and I punch you in the face, that's violent. No one would deny that. But now we're saying that just let's, I don't know, if I'm throwing a Frisbee and my hand hits your face, now that is often considered as violent in the same way that intentionally punching you in the face is considered to be violent. And I see, I reject this because it really muddies the waters regarding violent acts and it portrays people who do not have bad intentions as not dissimilar to people who do have bad intentions because we just say, well, they're just violent, whether it's based on ignorance or intention to do harm. So what are your thoughts about violence and concept creep? Yeah, look, we didn't use that as an example, but as I said, the six concepts I gave case studies of in that 2016 papers weren't meant to be exhaustive. Right. And certainly violence is a harm-related concept, you know, maybe uh, one of the most clearly um, uh, harm-related concepts. And yeah, look, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, people are now uh, more willing to refer to things as violence, which were not physical, but were really a psychological uh, or cultural. Um, and, you know, that might be horizontal to some extent. It might also be vertical. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I, mm -hmm. I mean, things right. can relax in two directions at once, right? Mm -hmm. um, and look, I think that idea that intent has sort of become a criterion that's loosened, that you don't need to have intent in order to uh, ascribe some behavior or call some behavior violence, uh, is a pattern that you observe in some of the other concepts as well. So the example I gave of bullying earlier, it's exactly the same. At one point, bullying had to be intentional behavior. Now, when I do my human resources modules at my university and it tells me how what workplace bullying is, it says it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or not. Uh, and that's a widespread change in the meaning. Um, and I agree that's a problem because I think part of the problem with concept creep is that it leads to a, a, a loss of important distinctions like that. It sort of treats unintentional harm as being as bad as intentional harm. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, uh, an issue which is concerning. And look, I, I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong place to, uh, you know, divide this sort of continuum of um, acts from violent to innocuous. Uh, you know, there is no bright line separating it and where it should go really is, you know, I think up to society. Mm -hmm. But I think it is a problem if people start having very different concepts of, you know, when violence has taken place. It's a, a recipe for social conflict uh, and disagreement. And yes, I, I, this is a long-winded way of saying I agree with you. I think um, this concept is a prime example of concept creep. We're often talking about violence. And I have to say this occurs more in the US than here. Uh, we don't have exactly the same cultures as you, uh, as you correctly pointed out, I think, earlier. Um, uh, but people are often talking about speech as violence in a way that is, I think, somewhat problematic and unintentional acts as violence, which is also, I think, um, problematic. And, and getting back to this idea of liberal moral, moral agenda that you mentioned earlier, um, I should also just note, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying um, uh, John Haidt, uh, his, his work and that of others has shown that sort of harm is sort of the ascendant sort of moral grammar Mm. of uh, people on the left side of the political spectrum. Um, that's uncontroversial. We consistently find that people who do have broader concepts of harm tend to be liberal. There's a correlation there, a sort of moderate sized correlation. Um, so I think it's not unreasonable to say that people who, are, if people who are more liberal tend to have broader concepts of harm, uh, and if some of the, um, the conceptual changes and broadenings are reflecting a desire to call things out as being harmful, which previously were tolerated, then it's not unreasonable to say that there's some sort of liberal moral agenda behind a lot of concept creep. Again, without making that a criticism, just pointing that out as part of the dynamic. Part of the dynamic when we call speech violence is to try to uh, problematize um, speech that is seen as being uh, dangerous or harmful. And that's um, not exclusively the province of the left, but um, in recent times, it probably has been. Mm. Sometimes when I have been in conversation with people about 
what we're talking about i have this sense like people will, will say you're just playing word games like what does it really matter if we're loosely defining things what, what would be your response like are we just playing word games here or is there something more substantive behind what we're talking about well, I mean, I would say this because I'm someone who cares about words, but I think words really matter. And if you're using words to refer to something entirely different from me, then there's a problem. There's a huge problem if it becomes an issue of law. If, I mean, the meaning of words is crucial for, for laws, for social norms, um, for communication. If we mean different things by prejudice, how can we possibly agree to how to reduce prejudice if what you mean by it is much broader than what I mean by it or vice versa? So, uh, I mean, I don't think this is word games. I think this is actual under-acknowledged changes in how we're using words and the concept underneath the words are what really matters rather than the words per se. Uh, and in an ideal situation, acknowledging that words always change in their meanings, that they're always in flux, uh, you know, nothing's stable, nor should it be stable. Social change is inevitable. Uh, it would be good if there was at least some sort of stability and degree of consensus about what some of these words mean. Mm. And I, I appreciate that you acknowledge that there's no bright line demarcating the boundaries of any concept. And, you know, that that's true. And so, you know, when it comes to some of these, some of the issues that are related to that very gray area, it's, you know, it sounds like everyone who's in conversation about issues like that are being very reasonable. But yeah, but but I do think that there are people who are totally unreasonable regarding you know how loosely they're using the word violent or trauma or bullying um and perhaps there's an opposite end of the spectrum perhaps there are people and who knows I, i'm just completely speculating but maybe there would be an, a correlation with people who are extremely conservative with defining things almost too tightly sometimes where you know a kid comes home and talks about being bullied and the dad's like well technically that's not bullying but it's like come on the kid's being bullied here you know i can i can imagine that extreme end of the spectrum too so where these fine lines are is difficult to discern yeah and look the fact is there just aren't any there you know there's just yeah. different people who are making different um, classifications in ways that make sense to them i mean i think one thing that um, often you hear here is that it's generational to some extent. So again, apologies for the self-promotion. Uh, and I know that this podcast won't go out instantaneously, but um, there was a New York Times editorial by David Brooks just uh, last weekend, which cited the concept creep idea uh, along the lines that some family conflicts, some sort of breakdowns in families are caused by these generational shifts in what words like abuse mean. So you gave the example of the ear pulling, but, I mean, treatment that would have been just normative when I was a kid are now forbidden. You don't mm. spank people anymore. Mm. Uh, I mean, I was rarely spanked because I'm sure I was angelic as, as, a, as a kid. But, uh, I mean, these things have changed. But if I now um, um, look back and think about, um, about this and think, oh, I was, uh, uh, this violence was perpetrated against me, I was abused. Um, and I'm not saying I was. Uh, my parents were lovely. Uh, that's a recipe for sort of intergenerational conflict. And often what you find in these stories, and I'm not a clinician in this area or in any area, uh, is that um, uh, the parents accused of abuse and who are, who, are, who are dealing with children making having grievances about how they were treated are just shocked because it's common sense to them that this is just ordinary behaviour. This isn't violence. This is just child rearing. This is just discipline. So I think there's this widespread sense that um, there's been a generational shift in, in the meanings of some concepts and people who are a bit older uh, tend to have narrower concepts and people a bit younger tend to have uh, broader concepts. And this is a part of what's uh, underlying not just the cultural wars, but also the sort of generational uh, wars. Funnily enough, we don't find that in our research. We don't find that younger people tend on average to have broader concepts than, um, than, than um, older people, uh, broader harm concepts. They don't tend on average to have broader concepts of what prejudice is, what abuse is, what harassment is, um, what a mental disorder is, for instance. Mm. So I don't think it's really as much generational as some people think it is, mm. but it's just one more way in which differences of beliefs about what words mean have real consequences in people's lives. Mm. An example. I would love to hear an example of 
just like, yeah, like one concrete example from you of concept, concept creep taking place that in a way needed to take place. And maybe while that percolates for you, I'll share an example. I once had a conversation with a man. He was living in Florida. He was talking to me and I, I won't, you know, obviously I won't identify him, but I know him well, family ties. And he was this, he was explaining to me the difference between like an N word and an N word. And he was pointing out certain African American people who are N words with an A at the end and certain African American people who are N words with an ER at the end. And to him, using the term with an A at the end and, and just the whole conversation was not racist or was not, a, you know, it was not racist, according to him. According to me, it was racist. It felt very racist. And so for me, I, I think that many people used to think like that, you know, that the definition of racism, racism would exclude, you know, calling black people N words with an A at the end. And so the fact that now the concept of racism has creeped out to include that too, strikes me as a good thing, because this is a very harmful way of talking. And so that that's, you know, that's one example that comes to my mind. And I, I'm curious to know, if you have an example coming to your mind as well of concept creep being a good thing. Well, I mean, I, I don't have a great example. I don't have one that's better than that. But I think, you know, for instance, in the sexual harassment space, uh, a lot of very dubious behavior around, um, you know, coercion, you know, often by men towards women uh, in, in sort of heterosexual relationships or encounters. Um, you know, a, a lot of bad behavior used to happen and problematizing that and calling it what it is, harassment has been a good thing. And it's meant that people have to tread a whole lot more carefully, people meaning in this case men, uh, and it's been a good thing and it's avoided, uh, hopefully, um, um, lots of uh, you know, troubling encounters and caused a lot less pain than would have been caused had that change not occurred. Mm. So I think there's a lot of examples where um, this sort of semantic broadening has been you know, unambiguously good, uh, but that doesn't mean it's always unambiguously good in all cases, and it doesn't mean it sometimes you know, doesn't overshoot the mark. Um, but again, what counts as right and wrong is very specific to a time and place. Mm. And so who knows if you are still doing this podcast 20 years from now and if I'm still alive then and if you still want to talk to me, uh, who knows what will be the common sense then? It might be radically different. Certainly the common sense 20 years ago um, would have been quite different. You know, 20 years ago, uh, I, was, I, I was living, I was just about to leave the USA. Uh, you know, 9-11 was happening. Uh, it was a very different cultural time and the norms were very different and word meanings were quite different. A lot of what this creep, um, uh, a lot of the creep that's occurred, I think, has occurred in the last 20 years or so. So, you know, this is what, what strikes us as common sense as being right versus wrong now uh, may not be so um, even a decade from now, maybe even five years. Excellent point. And the, the sexual harassment example, I think that's that's perfect perfect example that that needed to expand. There was a time when I think men could slap women on the butt in the workplace and that was not considered harassment. So obviously that concept needed to envelop that action as well. Um, why, why do you think there, like you wrote in the paper, concept creep is kind of asymmetrical in that it's focused in that you see this primarily with negative, like term the concepts that describe negative, um, types of human behavior um why is it asymmetrical why don't we see concept creep on the positive side of that spectrum yeah look i think i made a mistake um uh in that paper uh, mm -hmm. saying that really i mean a, a partial mistake i don't want to admit to a full mistake uh yet uh mm -hmm. but look i think most harm related words are undesirable are negative words because harm is negative by almost by definition right so it's not surprising that it's primarily undesirable concepts whose meaning has expanded. Mm -hmm. But I think if you say it's not so much negative words, which is how I sometimes said it in that 2016 paper, but rather harm-related words, mm -hmm. then um, uh, that allows you to see some positive words as expanding. So, for instance, safety is a good example, I think. You know, safety is harm-related because safety is all about protecting people mm -hmm. from harm. Uh, but safety is a good thing, right? Generally speaking, we prefer to be safe than unsafe. 
but the concept of safety has itself broadened. So I think um, you know, back in the day, safety was primarily about um, you know, being protected from physical damage and harm, you know, sticks and stones. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, I think people are seeing safety in terms of safety from undesirable ideas, thoughts, um, 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 ideologies, you name it. So I think safety is also expanded in a similar way to some of these other sort of negative harm-related concepts. And the common thread is harm, uh, it, it, to my way of thinking. Mm. Yeah, that's that's. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. That it has indeed expanded dramatically the, the meaning of safety, and it, it's interesting because, you know, like in in the coddling of the American mind, John Hyatt's book, he describes several specific stories where professors are um, accused of creating an unsafe environment for challenging students' ideas. And it's like that, that to me, I mean, it's almost like a stereotypical extreme liberal person who's in the classroom accusing a professor of being threatening or violent or making them feel unsafe because they're challenging their ideas. I do find that the ideas that are challenged, which make people feel unsafe are typically ideas related to their own identity. And just kind of thinking about the psychology of that, it, it makes some sense to me, you know, it's like, if I have a sense of self invested into this idea and you're, undermining this idea i feel undermined in my own existence so i understand it but it just feels like safety is certainly not the right word there or or being unsafe is not the right word to use there have you found do you teach in the classroom or are you primarily a researcher i do some teaching not a huge okay. amount and okay. um I think we do a whole lot less small class teaching than I'd like to. I, I gather you do a whole lot more of that and a lot of my stuff is lecturing, so less engaged. So I don't see as much of that. Mm. Uh, and I think the discourse of safety hasn't really caught on as much in Australia. We're always a few years behind uh, the US and Britain uh, and other parts of the world. Uh, and no doubt it'll, it'll come down the pike eventually. Um, but no, we don't see as much of that. And look, I think it's reasonable. I think, as you say, um, you know, this idea, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Actually, names do hurt people. I mean, it doesn't take a psychologist to know that um, um, social rejections, social exclusion, um, you know, name calling, having your identity questioned, having your sense of who you are as a person challenged in some way. I mean, that hurts too. Pain isn't only um, physical pain, but nevertheless, I agree that it does seem to be something a little bit strange about the elasticity of the concept of harm so that it includes those things along with these things. And it does mean that the concept of safety is expanded. And yes, people of my generation, perhaps I think it is partly generational, do find that a little bit confronting. Um, that This word that we thought meant one thing now means this other thing as well. It's just so interesting to me. And, and it's like, I can't help but see this as all of these concepts, all of this language, all of the meanings we have as being this sort of architecture of our mind that really primes our perception in meaningful ways. So if I have a definition of safety, that means that I, my, my identity can't be challenged, my ideas can't be challenged, my philosophy of life cannot be challenged, or I'll feel unsafe, it primes my perception to then to where I'm now perceiving any challenge to my ideas as a fundamental threat, which then gives rise to an emotion, um, you know, related to some variation of fight or flight, which then fuels my actions to get very, very defensive. So I'm just kind of like following the, the trail here. If you kind of consider all of these meanings of these words as being this sort of architecture of the human mind, and the way that it becomes the perceptual set through which a person is engaging with their world and just the the consequences of that emotionally and behaviorally yeah look i think if you have a broader concept of harm more things are threats yeah. uh, it's sort of almost self-evident so you're right i think as concepts of harm expand more and more things become problematic things to worry about things to fear or things to counterattack against 
Yeah. So it does sort of raise the emotional temperature, I think, to some extent, and make you know threat more salient to people. And I think we do have some work suggesting that uh, you know your your sensitivity to social threats is one of the factors that contributes to holding broader concepts of harm. So people who are more sensitised to threats are more likely to have broader concepts of harm. Um, not only them, also people who are more empathic, also women, also liberals tend to have broader concepts separate from this whole idea of threat sensitivity. But I think you're really onto something when you say that this uh, is creating a world where there is more danger and is more threat. Because if you like, our uh, threshold for deciding when negative things are present or when harm is, is, is present or possible uh, are dropping. Exactly. It's a great way to put it. The threshold for when we think danger is present is dropping. It's, it, that's exactly it. It's dropping vertically and it's expanding horizontally. Hmm. So interesting. I just think this is, like I said in the beginning, as relevant as can be this topic. I'm curious to talk a little bit about addiction because this is one of the examples you talk about. There are some clear horizontal expansions of the concept of addiction where now process addictions, behavioral addictions, non-drug addictions are included. And so what are your thoughts about the advantages and disadvantages of that concept creep? This is one of the concepts I know less about. So I probably should be a bit more careful. Uh, look, I think, um, yeah, I know I did talk about it as one of the case studies in 2016, but uh, haven't really given it too much thought okay. now. But I agree. I mean, a lot of, you know, back in the day, addictions were, you know, two things which created physiological dependence, which were all about consuming, taking stuff into your body, um, usually chemicals of some sort. And as you get a, these more behavioral addictions, so-called, um, it does become strange where you draw the line between what is an addiction and what is just a bad habit uh, or, or some sort of, um, you know, character flaw or something like that. Uh, and I think, um, I, and I understand from those who are sort of more sort of uh, neuroscientific than I am because I'm just not that interested in uh, neuroscience personally, that there are a lot of similarities physiologically uh, between behavioral addictions and chemical addictions. So uh, I think that's a reason why it's reasonable to expand the concept if the concept is referring to the underlying process rather than just the type of thing which you are addicted to, um, then that's a legitimate grounds for extending it. I just worry about where is the line? Because I think there was, I think at some point, a pretty clear line between the sorts of substances that were addictive from those which weren't. Right. Uh, Probably not a completely bright line, but a clearer line. Whereas as soon as you allow behavioural addictions, as I say, it's less clear to me that clear distinctions can be made between, as I say, bad habits and, and, and genuine addictions. Yes. And the only thing I worry about with addiction is that, rightly or wrongly, I think um, people in the culture tend to think that if you have an addiction, there's not much you can do about it. Mm. So if you define something as an addiction, it seems to me, and look, correct me if I'm wrong about this, because you probably know more about this than I do. If you define something as an addiction, <clears throat> you tend to feel that you're powerless in the face of it. It's just something that is, you know, has control over you. And then generally speaking, if you want to change a bad habit or something, you know, something that you do which you would rather not do, it's better to feel that you have some efficacy over it, even to overestimate that efficacy. Even if you don't really have efficacy over something, it's better to think you have some. Mm. And so to the extent that an addiction framing um, creates some sort of view that the problematic behavior you want to change is unchangeable or maybe unchangeable without some sort of medical intervention, then I have a problem with it. Mm. Yes. Then it would be dangerous to just sweep every bad habit under the rug of addiction and describe it all in that way. Yes, I, I agree well, with it, that. It, it can become excuse making. Yes. Uh, you know, and it's not to say it usually is or always is, um, but uh, it's just to say it, it can be. And so that's my only concern. But again, this is from the standpoint of a rank amateur in addiction studies. Makes sense. Yeah. And I don't spend my time in the ocean of literature on addiction, but some of the work I do outside the classroom is in a jail. And most of the people I get to know in that jail are in there on drug charges and have addictions to really serious substances, you know, methamphetamine, heroin, prescription drugs, and I get to know what a real addiction looks like. And 
it's it's interesting i mean it, there's there's not a homogeneity around their philosophy of addiction some people have a much stronger sense of an internal locus of control than others do so i can't even generalize any philosophy to all the people i work with in the jail but there's definitely that that spectrum of people who who feel powerless and feel that there is this impersonal force within them called an addiction that they have absolutely no control over and, and it's in the driver's seat but then i've seen people who are seemingly have the same degree of dependency on a substance have a, just a much different mindset around it um yeah so so this doesn't exactly relate to the concept of addiction creeping out more just like ways we think about addiction but but i agree that it would be dangerous especially if a person has that um view of addiction where it's just not my fault it's the addiction running the show and then if that philosophy is if that's the definition of addiction and then we expand addiction to include binge watching netflix shows eating too many donuts etc that would be very dangerous because it would breed a sense of just kind of powerlessness over our own behavior for sure and look i think um uh, again uh, I, i'm i'm furiously agreeing with you uh, on that and i don't know how prevalent this is but i mean the experiment to do would be just to get a bunch of people who have some sort of problematic behavior assess their mindsets about uh, you, know, you know whether they define what, what they're doing as addiction or something else and just see who spontaneously tends to uh, get over it better or who engages better with some sort of intervention to improve it and look uh, i'm sure people have already done something like this um but look i think you know a lot of these concepts are examples of concept creep um but they all have their specificities so each concept has its own um you know uh, separate meanings and the meanings of addiction are all wrapped up in as you know you know, you know centuries of thinking about uh, about this sort of phenomenon uh and i guess in some treatment modalities i guess um believing that you're powerless over the addiction is an important step towards overcoming it right. you know so the 12 step kind of idea mm -hmm. uh so look there's probably no simple answers but i think it's unquestionably a concept that has broadened right uh, and people are using it much more loosely than they once did yes and just to kind of emphasize further this um this point you make that that there there's simply aren't these lines between who does and doesn't have a certain disorder who does and doesn't have addiction who is and isn't a victim of violence and things like that i i agree with that very strongly and that's partly why some of the criteria in the dsm are called into question because they attempt to draw those lines brightly quite brightly i mean we we don't have to read uh, symptom criteria of a disorder right now but it, you know for, for many of them it will say things like if 3 to 5 of these symptoms persist for four or more weeks in two or more settings that qualifies as having this disorder i understand why it's practical to draw these lines in some sense when we're talking about providing medical assistance i suppose we just have to it's not an issue that um you know i, I don't i almost said real medical doctors as opposed to psychiatrists but i'm not a, i'm not hating on psychiatry altogether but it's not a problem that uh, every other medical specialty has to deal with because physical diseases are quantitative measurable the lines that define them are often much more clearly right like a virus has a has a dna profile that you can recognize as being in the system or not but when it comes to psychology it's just it's much more gray it's not black and white and and you know the dsm is i think a a valiant effort to medicalize behavior and problematic behavior and so i understand why it's practical to try to draw these lines but just kind of you know again saying that that's partly why diagnostic expansion i think is called into question by so many people is because it's pretty obvious that these lines are drawn quite arbitrarily 
So just commentary on that. Yeah, look, I, I, I'll, I'll try to disagree a bit with you just to make this more interesting. Yeah. Uh, although I, I, I 90% agree with you. Look, I, I, I think you're right that, um, uh, that it, you know, that pretty much everything in the psychopathology domain is, is a spectrum. And, and, you know, my other side of work, um, which I've been doing for 27 years, I think it is, uh, has been exactly on that issue of distinguishing between dimensional and categorical models mm -hmm. of um, you know, uh, um, psychopathology and, and personality and everything else. And, you know, we, we did a big meta-analysis of all the studies that have used this um, preferred method for testing between categorical and dimensional models of mental disorders, um, um, personality characteristics, you name it. And, and basically, pretty much everything is dimensional. You know, everything, there are no bright lines, there are no category boundaries. And there's been a real revolution to the point where that's now seen as the common sense view, but it wasn't the common sense view even 30 years ago. Um, and so you do have this reality where everything is on a continuum, pretty much. There might be a, a small number of exceptions to that, but they are rare exceptions. All personality is not about types. All personalities on a continuum. And I know you believe this, well, I suspect you believe this as well. And that's an issue because it does mean, as you say, that we are a little bit unlike some medical specialties. I would say, though, it's probably not quite as stark as you said it was. So, for instance, rheumatology, um, I, I'm reliably informed by people in that specialty that actually, you know, their world is also without joints, um, pardon the pun. You know, that there are no, you know, the, 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 uh, there's a spectrum of conditions deciding where to draw the line between whether someone has the rheumatological condition or not is also a little bit arbitrary. Uh, and, and the fact that there is this continuum means that arbitrariness is uh, um, necessary. You can't find a way around it. But I think arbitrary sort of can mean two things. So I agree that when you look at some of those DSM diagnostic rules, they sound ridiculous. You know, why three, not four? You know, why two weeks, not three weeks? And, you know, anyone reading that will say, well, of course, that's, that, that just sounds like they've plucked something out of a hat. Generally speaking, they haven't. So it's arbitrary in the sense that it could be somewhere else and that it's not corresponding to some objective break in nature. But it's not necessarily arbitrary in the sense that it's a stupid place um, or, or that it, there isn't some grounds for having it. I mean, I, to take another example. Um, um, you know, you could use blood pressure, but I mean, say, to take height. You know, you, you know, I think if you're talking about the height of uh, adult males, um, people traditionally would say you know, six foot might qualify as tall. I don't know. Um, that's arbitrary, right? Why not 5'11", why not 5'10", why not 6'3"? Uh, there's no objective reality. You don't suddenly change qualitatively at that point. But um, on the other hand, if you said 5 foot, you would be stupid. If you said 7 foot, you would be stupid. There is, it is not arbitrary in the sense that there isn't a more sensible place to put it. And I think what in trying to defend some of the practices that the DSM has gone through is they're trying to calibrate it in a way, knowing that there is a continuum, trying to cut it in a way where it makes some sort of sense, even in the absence of any bright lines, even the absence of any evidence that above that point, something qualitatively changes. So they're in a difficult situation. You know, people like categories. We sometimes need to make categorical decisions about, you know, diagnosis or treatment. So what do you do? Um, do you just give up on diagnosis or do you say, well, I recognise this is arbitrary. I recognise I'm not picking out a true category here. But for pragmatic reasons, this is roughly the right place to cut the line. And this is roughly the right set of rules to cut it at that place. Mm -hmm. So I've got a bit of a soft spot, um, a bit of sympathy for the DSM developers, even though I think often they've got things wrong. Mm. Very strong argument. Totally makes sense. Yeah. And, and the analogy of drawing the line between tall and not tall is, is perfect. It's like that is a sensible place to put it, even though... Obviously, 5'11 and 6'1 are not far from six foot. So it's a like I like the way you put it. There's no natural or I, you said there's no objective break in nature. It's a very good way to put it. I like that. Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, just one more comment on this. I think where people really are get concerned about drawing these lines and defining disorders from not from not disorders is what the treatment then is you know because if you know if you're diagnosed with something and then you're accessing some type of treatment that is virtually harmless and just nothing but supportive 
I don't think anyone would be up in arms about a little diagnostic diagnostic expansion. But I think for many people, it's the concern with the, you know, quick prescriptions of psychiatric drugs that are very concerning. So, so kind of in the same way that I was saying, if you have a certain idea of addiction as meaning that you're powerless, and then that expands, that's problematic. Kind of like that, if you have this idea that all disorders need to be treated with psychiatric drugs, and then you loosen the criteria for all these disorders, and therefore just make everybody um, a candidate for being prescribed a drug, then there's a problem that that's concerning. Um, yeah. Yeah, look, I absolutely agree. And, and look, ideally, I think we'd, we'd, be, we'd be sort of calibrating where we put these, um, you know, diagnostic lines based exactly on that sort of consideration. You know, what are the, the costs of making it too broad? What are the costs of making it too narrow? What are the advantages of making it too broad or broader versus narrower? And, and you'd think that some sort of clever economical cost benefit analysis would be able to find a sweet spot, which might be quite different from where we draw it now. But I think my point, which I, I suspect you would agree with, is that it's possible to be too broad and it's possible to be too narrow. Uh, and you don't want to over-treat and you don't want to under-treat. Yeah. Um, so it's a challenge and it's a challenge. We've just got to recognise we're living in this sort of slippery dimensional space where there are no bright lines. So we've just got to do the best pragmatic job we can. Mm. Humankinds are moving targets, as you said. Um, okay, this is just such... A great conversation. I love. I love the topic. Let me ask you just about your book, the, the psychology in the bathroom. Tell me, what was that book about? Well, that book was my pathetic act of rebellion against um, about a decade of work I'd been doing previously on pretty dark subjects like dehumanization and prejudice, and I sort of wanted to have an escape. Uh, and again, I could have probably bought a sports car or taken a big holiday, but I decided to write, write a book about excretion, um, the psychology thereof. So it's not actually about bathrooms if you think it's about interior design. It's actually mm -hmm. about poo, pee, farting, um, and the psychology thereof, and, and serious stuff like, you know, um, uh, like phobias associated with, with this irritable bowel syndrome, Freud's ideas of the anal character, uh, basically everything I could think of to do with uh, the psychology of um, the fact that we are beings who excrete, which is something which really, I think, is largely under-acknowledged. It, it was partly, you know, it was a, a serious academic work. It wasn't just played for laughs, which is probably why no one bought it or read it. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, yeah, look, it was an attempt to just to rescue all of this interesting stuff which we know about um, this, part, this sort of shameful aspect of our bodies the fact that it excretes uh, and just put it together in a sort of amusing short book. I mean, and also other sort of more social things, like I had a whole chapter on toilet graffiti, mm. which, believe it or not, there's huge literature on. Mm. Um, some of it just fascinating. Folklorists study it, anthropologists study it, social theorists study it, feminist scholars study it, psychologists mm. study it. Um, and, you know, this, I, I'm just interested in curiosities from history as well. I mean, some of the interesting ideas people had about um, where psychosomatic problems involving the gut came from. So people like Thomas Sass, you know, the myth of mental illness guy, he, he started off his career writing about um, you know, sort of the psychosomatics of diarrhea exactly. uh, and stuff like this. You know, there's all sorts of just stuff, and it, most of it's wrong and stupid. Um, and some of the work on, on, on the so-called anal character, Freud's ideas, are kind of... Um, silly if you read them now as quite a bit of some of that early psychoanalytic stuff mm. was while having a grain of truth in that the anal character basically is obsessive compulsive personality mm. disorder i mean it's basically the same thing it just actually has nothing to do with the anus mm -hmm. uh so th this was just um a fun project i wrote it um uh, i think uh, published about 2012 from memory um vastly overpriced by the publisher um, so only a few libraries bought it. I plead with them to bring out a paperback, but by the time the paperback came out a couple of years later, the um, media buzz had died down. Mm. But look, I would um, heartily recommend this book to your uh, to your uh, audience. It's sort of fun if you're in, if you're a psychology nerd uh, and you don't mind you know reading something which isn't just played for laughs and chuckles, but actually tells you something interesting about this part of the human experience. Um, then I recommend it. And, you know, John Height, who um, you've mentioned a few times, wrote a nice blurb for it. Um, mm. 
he and I shared an office in grad school for, for several years, so I, I sort of know him pretty well. Uh, and you know, it was just it was just a fun thing to do, uh, and as I say, a kind of pathetic act of rebellion. Love it. I, uh, you know, kind of it kind of captures the spirit of this podcast. The name of it is Psychology Is, which is based on the saying, "Where people are, psychology is," which is you know, again capturing the spirit of the pr- kind of omnipresent nature of psychology. It really is everywhere people are and in everything people do including farting and peeing and pooping and excreting so who knows maybe maybe we're uh, destined to have a part two conversation entitled the psychology of excretion it could be interesting i would love that um yeah look i, I was a bit sad that it didn't get more attention at, you know uh, i mean and i did get quite a few strange media requests and occasional very strange sort of letters and, and emails from from people but, um, but but yeah, it never really caught on. But I, I think it, you know people are realizing the importance of the, the you know the gut brain axis. People are, I mean, the gut microbiome is very very trendy in, in in psychology these days. And I've got a couple of students who are working on how um, uh, you know aspects of you know, gut function relate to anxiety and depression. Mm. So maybe it's going to come back uh, and, and become a hot topic all over again. Mm. But uh, look, it was fun to do, and I was like, I couldn't agree more. There's so much psychology out there. Or so much that psychologists could do beyond what they primarily do. Right. Um, stuff. And this is one example. Yes, indeed. Um, I'll ask you one, one more question. You know, I, I, I'm very inspired by scholars like you who have just contributed so much to the field. It's, it's I mean, I guess you technically could calculate it, but I, not really. It's, it's incalculable. I mean, you can calculate the number of papers and books you've written, but just the the sheer influence you've had is inspires me. And so my question is, how have you been able to be so productive? Well, look, thanks for the flattery. And and I'll I'll try to get this on tape. So whenever I'm having personal self-doubts, I can get some reassurance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look, I think the the serious answer would be um, really good colleagues, um, uh, really good students, um, and just a kind of stubborn temperament. I mean, I, I've just always had a vision of what I wanted my research to be about. I didn't necessarily want it to be trendy. I didn't, I sort of wanted it to be broad. I've tried to be a generalist, not to be a specialist. I started off in clinical. I taught personality. I teach social now. I try to sort of know a little about a lot, mm-hmm. um, which is sort of against the gravity, as you know, of academia. Yeah. So, and I think having lots of wide interests allows you to sort of write more, you know, maybe you're more of an amateur in what you do write, but you can, you know, there's more you can write about and there's more that you find fascinating. Yeah. So it's part of that. And I think, but probably also you know, part of the serious answer would be uh, having a somewhat unbalanced life. So I think, you know, some people do work far too hard. I probably, in retrospect, I could have written, you know, half as much and had about two thirds as much influence. So, you know, you can sort of look back and think, you know, maybe I uh, should have smelled the roses a little bit more. Uh, and this is, I think, something which is really an issue for earlier career researchers. They see some of their elders um, do not much but work and be too wrapped up in their work. Um, and I, I feel I've been a bit guilty of that. Um, I'm not trying to self-disclose too much here, Nick. But, uh, but look, I think, yeah, I think... I've, I've, I've just worked very, very hard and I've found my field very, very fascinating. Um, and uh, I've just been buoyed along by some just terrific, inspiring people who are, you know, much more um, influential than I am. Wow, beautiful. Well, congratulations on such a successful career and I, I'm... I'm excited for what's next for you and I'm very grateful that we're connected now. I hope and trust this is not our last interaction. I hope not too. Um, so look, this was uh, this was good. Thanks a lot, Nick. I really appreciate the uh, chance to talk. You're very welcome. And I'll just say here as we close to the listeners, I always love to give a you know heartfelt shout out to the people who listen to the whole conversation or at least that skip through and listen to the major parts of it. And it's just, that's the fuel for me doing this you know as is the thought that there are people who are actually uh, 
whose lives are enriched by these long form conversations and who find it to be genuinely intriguing. So to those of you who are listening and watching still, thank you. I'm so glad this was of value. And I look forward to seeing you again, Dr. Haslam, and connecting with the listeners and watchers again, too. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.